Good evening. I'm Robin Franzen Parker, Public Affairs Director for the City. Welcome to the 2014 State of the City Address, and thank you so much for being here and participating in what has become a wonderful civic and community event here in Gresham. Before we begin tonight, I'd like to ask that everyone silence their mobile devices at this time. And now, I'd like to ask everyone to rise as the Gresham Police and Fire Honor Guards present the colors. And now I'd like to ask you to turn your attention to the flag and to remove your hats as the Gresham High School overtones lead us in the national anthem. Thank you so much to the Police and Fire Honor Guards and to the Gresham Overtones for that beautiful music and for being with us here tonight. And now, since I'm told the Overtones may have some homework to do this evening and need to leave, you are dismissed with our sincerest thanks and gratitude. Next, Mayor Bemis is asked 
that Lori Stegman, President of the Gresham City Council, introduce him tonight. And so it's my pleasure to introduce to you Council President Lori Stegman. Wow, that was really great. Let's hear it for the Honor Guard and one more time for the Gresham High School Overtones. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. My name is Lori Stegman, as Robin said, and I'm honored to serve as this year's council president. One of my responsibilities as council president is to introduce the mayor for this annual State of the City Address. Or as I see it, this is an opportunity for me to say whatever I want about the mayor, and there isn't anything he can do about it. It just so happens that I have a copy with me of the October 2013 Squire magazine. Apparently, it is possible to get mentioned in the Esquire for something other than classy, uh, apparently classy style, expensive alcohol, or elegant cars. So if you haven't heard yet, our mayor was prominently featured in an article about mayors and cities that are doing innovative work across the country. Unfortunately, he was not selected to appear in Esquire for his boyish looks, his fashion sense, or even his 1972 Chevrolet van. <laughs> However, that did not preclude him from being featured because of Gresham's innovative garage to storefront program and the economic development that it inspired. I think that's pretty cool that Gresham is getting national attention for its basic common sense approach to the challenges that all cities face. As a relative newcomer to the political arena, I've observed and studied the mayor over the last few years. I know his deep roots in Gresham have paid great dividends to our city. Starting with his four-year term on city council and his rise to mayor in 2007 and re-election in 2011, he has tenaciously fought for our safety on light rail, promoted Gresham's small business environment, recruited jobs and economic development, and challenged our residents to dream about the future. That tireless advocacy has paid off. Mayor Bemis's leadership was apparent at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Through his lobbying efforts on Capitol Hill, our city was able to secure grant funding for additional police officers and firefighters two areas of desperate need in our city. Finally, when I was thinking about writing this introduction, it occurred to me that my daughter, Rachel, who serves on the city's Youth Advisory Council, is a proud student at Barlow High School. And by the way, she's a 4.0 student. Yeah, very proud of her. And as you all know, the mayor is a distinguished alumnus of Gresham High School. At first, I thought it was pretty magnanimous of him to look past those rivalries when making appointments to the Youth Advisory Council. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that his motive wasn't really about bridging those divides. It was that he needed to get good, sound advice. And the only way to do that was to have some Bruins around him. <laughs> of course, I'm just kidding. We have amazing kids in all of our schools, and I am extremely proud of all the kids who are on the Youth Advisory Council, and I look forward to that next generation of leaders. But for tonight, we are gathered to hear from one of today's greatest leaders, in my opinion, someone whose heart is in the right place, someone who is willing to fight for Gresham, someone who is paving the way for what we believe in. Please join me in a warm welcome to Mayor Shane Bemis for the 2014 State of the City Address. I didn't think there was anybody left other than my mother that had copies of this, but. <laughs> well, city councilors, elected leaders, citizens, staff, and friends of Gresham. Thank you for attending the 2014 State of the City Address. Perhaps never before 
In Gresham's 109-year history, have we stood at a crossroads with more at stake, positive or negative, based upon the direction we will collectively choose for this city. When we were thinking about where to hold this year's State of the City Address, we were aiming for a location that would set the appropriate context for the point of time in which we find ourselves and what we have on the line. The more we thought about it, the more it just made sense to hold this annual event in an institution that represents the future of Gresham, because ultimately, that's what we have on the line at this very moment. When I came to Gresham from Montana at age 15, oh, come on. Good night, everybody. God bless you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> wow. Well, you saw the mullet. Okay. So I enrolled here at Gresham High, my eyes wide open to the world, and I found myself immediately welcomed by a community beaming with pride. I remember learning about the Oregon Trail migration and being fascinated that such a massive group of people were willing to lay it all on the line to move their families west looking for a better life. Those pioneers settled in this area, and many of their descendants are still here today. And to put it simply, if we weren't cut from that same cloth, I might be a little bit worried about where we are right now. But instead, I am confident that just like those early pioneers, we'll collectively choose to refuse a mediocre future or a downward decline, and we will instead take the actions necessary, however rigorous, to build a prosperous community for all of the young people who will pass through this building or any of the other schools in this great city. The State of the City Address is one of my favorite events of the year because it focuses, it focuses to stop and evaluate our community from the very small picture detail to the incredibly big picture detail. And this evening we will cover our organizational progress and public safety, economic development, parks, and efforts we take behind the scenes to help our operational costs and keep them as low as possible. And of course, we'll discuss how important the next few months will be in the trajectory of our community in terms of choosing to invest in vital services. But before I go too deep into those issues, I do want to pause and recognize some important individuals who have uh, joined us this evening. Um, I would like to introduce uh, our host this evening, the principal of Gresham High School, John Cook, is here. Um, former Councilor Thomas Griffin from the city of Gresham, Former Councilor Carol Nielsen Hood is with us. Former Councilor Paul Working. Uh, James Hugh from Gresham Barlow School District is here. Thank you. Um, of course, former Speaker of the House Lynn Snodgrass. Metro Councilor Shirley Craddock is with us. Uh, uh, Chairman of Fire District 10, the illustrious Michael McKeel is in the house. Uh, and uh, Centennial Superintendent Sam Breyer is with us as well. And of course, I'd like to introduce the members of my family um, that are with me, my beautiful wife, Alex, my oldest son, Derek, uh, my middle son, Jacob, the littlest son, could not suffer through tonight, uh, my mother, Corey, my stepfather, Jerry, and my mother-in-law, Nora, who is here as well. So thank you for all of the support that you give me. I mentioned my, uh, my three boys, and my oldest son, Derek, will uh, we'll be enrolling here at Gresham High in just three short years, and they say that time flies, but holy cow. Uh, Derek, here's the deal, buddy. Um, I hope you can finally bring home the Mr. Gresham trophy for this family. <laughs> Despite all of my attempts, I, I was first runner-up four years in a row, so you got to get it, buddy. I, he can do it, too. I'd also like to recognize the members of our city council who are here this evening. After serving uh, on the city council for four years and for eight years as mayor, I can tell you that this is a talented and cohesive group with a tremendous heart for this community. When I first joined the council in 2003, I could not believe the level of discontent, incivility, and dysfunction that was on display in front of our residents. Frankly, it was quite embarrassing. Fast forward to today, where we work together as a group to collectively shape policy and meet the dynamic needs of our residents. That has grown increasingly unusual in American politics, and I'm incredibly proud of what we have become. I'd like to ask you to give Council President Lori Stegman, Councilors Carolyn Eccles, Mike McCormick, Mario Palmero, Jerry Hinton, and Kirk French a warm thank you for their service and leadership. Councilors, thank you for your teamwork.
Thank you also to Gresham High School Overtones for the lovely rendition of the national anthem, and of course, our Gresham Police and Fire Honor Guards for presenting the colors. As I said before, we chose to be at Gresham High School tonight because it felt like the most appropriate place for this message at this point in time, given that this is a good example of our community's collective future. Raise your hand if you went to Gresham High School. Yeah, isn't that great? Now raise your hand if you went to Barlow, Reynolds, or Centennial. Good job, you guys are really coming along great. <laughs> I kid, I kid, but, but isn't it amazing how many of our residents have been in this community for a really long time? This is not just some random suburb, some generic enclave of McMansions and TGI, TGI Fridays. We are an old fold collective community of families, legacies, histories, and the sense that we have what it takes to face the greatest issues of our time, because our parents and our grandparents did, and so too will we. There are major economic forces at play in this region that desperately want us to become the landing zone for gangs, poverty, and depreciated land values and declining livability. If we do nothing, if we invest nothing, They'll succeed, I promise. On the other hand, if we decide that Gresham is more important than that, and that collectively we want to change the trajectory of these conditions, we'll regain prominence, stability, and a path forward that looks something like the fond memories of our childhood. Before we talk about the upcoming levy, however, I want to assure you that to a person, this city council works tirelessly to keep our costs as modest as possible. Through prudent fiscal management at the hands of one of the best city managers in Oregon, we have repeatedly identified savings and have trans that have translated to the public good. I'll give you some examples of that, but before I get there, I want to take a moment and thank our city manager, Eric Kavarston, for his excellent administrative leadership over our organization. We have known for some time that we have a, a terrific city manager, and this year we were validated by the League of Oregon Cities, which awarded Eric their highest honor. Uh, it's the Herman Curley Award, and it is pretty much the Hall of Fame for city managers in the state of Oregon. And I'm just uh, thankful that that man shows up every day for work to run this city. Thank you, Eric, for your service. I also want to thank a couple folks that work closely with me as well, Eric Chambers, who has been at my side since I took office, and Jessica Harper, who have helped to put this event on tonight. Thank you for everything you do uh, to keep me moving down the right track. Now, <clears throat> let me give you just a couple of examples that demonstrate the lengths we pursue to save our taxpayers money. I think one of the best examples of our fiscal frugality is our streetlight fund. Now, streetlights must be one of the most boringly important city services we provide. But they decrease crime, they increase home values, and they give people a heightened sense of security in their neighborhoods. Yet, they don't draw a ton of attention, and they're not cheap. As we projected forward and considered rising electricity costs, we realized that without intervention, our streetlight fund would bottom out in the near future, resulting in either the lights going dark or increased costs for our residents, as displayed on this slide. Now, as I said, the lion's share of these expenses go toward electricity and maintenance costs for our power utility. So we have very little room to maneuver, and this is not a sustainable forecast, neither fiscally nor environmentally. For this reason, we looked hard to find any and all opportunities to drive down uh, the cost of delivering this service. And here's what we discovered. By taking advantage of an extremely favorable borrowing rate, less than 1%, we could replace street lights, street light bulbs citywide with new high efficiency LED lights. These will save us approximately a half a million dollars in electricity and maintenance costs each year, while providing cleaner, brighter light using less energy and deterring crime. Now you can really see the full impact of what I'm talking about on the second slide. By putting in the time and energy in making these investments in our street light fund, rather than bottoming out as it would have before on the brown line, it becomes a sustainable enterprise that even begins to increase over time, as you can see on the green line. Through this innovative project, we get to do the right thing for the environment, stabilize a service fund, and provide a better product for our residents while avoiding the cost increases for the customers. That's good government. Staying on the topic of energy savings, in recent years, we took a hard look at our own city facilities and asked what we could do to get our energy costs down again, saving taxpayers money. 
As you can see on this slide, our efforts have worked. Through heating and cooling system upgrades, across the board changes to our lighting system, and leveraging federal grants to effectively use solar power, we have gone from a peak consumption in 2009 of almost 1.5 million kilowatt hours at City Hall to an estimated 988,000 kilowatt hours in 2013. In about four years, the city has reduced its power purchase by 33% at City Hall. These improvements have resulted in an immediate savings of around 50,000 a year, and electricity is not getting any cheaper. Now, you're probably familiar with our ongoing work at the wastewater treatment plant to save power and money. Traditionally, wastewater treatment plants are one of local government's biggest power hogs, which equates to being one of local government's biggest money hogs as well. We have worked tirelessly to change that in Gresham. Through the use of co-generator engines burning methane from the treatment process and turning it into power and renewable energy sources like solar, the wastewater treatment plant is currently producing 88% of the power it needs on site, and we project that by 2015, it could actually be the first plant we know of in the nation producing more energy than it consumes. The imp no. So those improvements that we have made already to date save residents about $600,000 each year, and we have more opportunity to even do better. We are, very, we are very lean financially, but that does not mean that we are not stable and prudent. For example, the city's per capita debt load is seven times less than that of our neighbor to the west. Charting a secure course for our children's future cuts both ways in terms of making investments and also refusing to saddle them with debt. I could go on about the $400,000 uh, traffic signal that we scraped together and built with our own crew for a tenth of that cost, or the excellent job our uh, investment specialists do each year to make every dollar stretch, but at the end of the day, that savings will never be enough. We have a fundamental funding crisis in Gresham, caused by a fluke in the property tax reforms locking Gresham's permanent property tax rate in at a dramatically low number. Now, as a fiscal conservative, I have always wanted us to be competitively, competitively affordable, and I firmly believe that government should stretch and tighten and do the most it can with the resources it has available. That said, we cannot go on any longer at the bottom of the list and still maintain the quality of life that we have enjoyed in Gresham for many years. You have probably seen this 10-city comparison before, but it's worth revisiting briefly. As you can see on this slide, if you take the 10 largest cities in Oregon and compare what it costs the average household for conventional city services like police, fire, parks, economic development, code enforcement, and planning, you can see that Gresham, even with the temporary fee on the books, is firmly at the bottom. Now, as I've said before, we are incredibly proud of our efficiency. But if we keep doing exactly what we are doing, I can promise you that the issues we face with gangs and poverty will go from threatening our future to defining who we are. That is unacceptable. We are better than that. What is the impact of being the lowest on that chart? This slide will show a list of every city in the state of Oregon that is reported in the FBI's police officers per capita statistics. Now for comparison purposes, we calculated it with what our staffing ratio would be without the positions currently being funded through the existing fee revenue, expiring fee revenue. I'll list them for you here from top to bottom with the highest officers per capita first and the lowest last. Gresham will be displayed in red. There you are. Now, despite the low number of officers we have per capita, our police department does tremendous work. I am constantly... I am constantly stunned by the efficiency with which our officers solve cases, from property crimes to homicides. We have tremendous police officers who are only restrained by their narrow ranks. 
I'm also very excited that just this last November, we celebrated the grand opening of the Rockwood Police Facility, delivering on one of the most important goals of the voter-approved Urban Renewal Authority. We will use this facility to coordinate our gang enforcement team and other important strategic police services, and we will also use it as, community, as a community space and as a place where we can partner with agencies like the Boys and Girls Club, Friends of the Children, who are both going to make awesome progress in helping us have fewer criminals and more kids with a brighter future. In addition to taking a comparative look at our police department, we wanted to do a similar analysis of how we stack up when it comes to fire EMS employees per capita. This, shot, this slide shows every comparable fire EMS department in the nation, ranked in order from highest to lowest staffing per capita. As you can see, it's the same story. We are tremendously lean and efficient. Now, despite our relatively lower ranks, Gresham enjoys one of the best cardiac survival rates in the nation. Our fire employees work tremendously hard and are well-trained, but if we can't keep their fire stations opened and staffed, we can't respond with the same level of expediency, and unfortunately, we won't enjoy that level of service any longer. To be clear, when we talk about a level of service in this regard, we're, we're not talking about the difference between a regular cup of coffee and a mocha. We're talking about fire EMS service quality. We're talking about actual lives and being there for our residents when they need us the most. To give you a pertinent recent example, you need look no further than exactly one week ago today when in the midst of a vicious winter storm, residents in our Southern Butte neighborhoods found themselves immobilized for the most part by snow and ice. Now, for many of us, that means we load up Netflix, we prepare some popcorn and hot chocolate and watch the kids slide down the road. But for, fa well, for one family in the Gresham Butte neighborhood last week, it actually meant life and death. A young lady, 20 years of age, started experiencing breathing difficulty. She has a history with asthma, which can be particularly inflamed by dry, cold air. The family thought it was no big deal at first, employing her rescue inhaler, which usually does the trick but not this time. The asthma progressed aggressively and her difficulty breathing quickly turned into not being able to get air at all. To give you some idea of what was at stake, there is no chance in the world that they were going to be able to get her to the hospital. Desperately, they called 911 for help. Now, I'm going to scoop my own story here and tell you that Gresham firefighters arrived on the scene and literally saved her life. And in a moment, I'm going to ask those incredible first responders to stand and be recognized. But before I do that, I want to give you a quick idea of what else had to happen in order for this story to have a happy ending. Seeing a severe winter storm closing in, we opened up our emergency operations center, which practices this type of scenario routinely, and knew that we needed to put, we knew that we needed to put our fleet maintenance shop on 24-hour operations to keep our first responder vehicles operating no matter what the conditions were. Now our fleet staff work behind the scenes and around the clock throughout the storm to keep our police cars, our fire engines, and our snow plows on the roads delivering services. I don't know if these guys were aware that when they were missing a family dinner, instead they were chaining up a fire engine, that they too were saving a life. But they were, and, and I don't want their dedication to go unrecognized. With Lieutenant Mark Robinson, Firefighter William Eddy, Firefighter Kevin Larson, Firefighter Miles Brokaw, and Larry Davidson, David Knapp, and Brian Morris of our fleet crew, please stand and be recognized for your service. Good work. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for your work. It's worth pausing for a moment here to mention that we, we have tremendous leadership in both our police and fire departments. Police Chief Craig Juniger and Fire Chief Greg Matthews work incredibly hard with their departments to deliver excellent service for our residents. Chiefs, thank you both for your service. Now, our public safety employees were not the only ones scrambling to protect our most vulnerable residents during the storm. Members of our faith community also leapt into action to open warming centers for those in need. St. Henry's Church, First Baptist Church, Anawim Sanctuary Church routinely stepped forward to provide this service. But given the length of the storm, we needed more this time. As an example of how incredible these folks are, I called Joby Butcher at noon on Thursday and asked if Grace Community Church might be able to open a warming center. He called back by two and said they'd be glad to. 
We're incredibly fortunate to have such outstanding partners in our faith community. Please extend our appreciation for those who opened up their doors for Gresham's most vulnerable during this storm. A few weeks ago, contemplating on how best to speak to the state of our city, it occurred to me that it would be good if we checked in with some of our younger students, if we asked them about their aspirations for Gresham and what they'd like to see for the future of their city. I checked in with members of our city's Youth Advisory Council, even the Barlow Bruins, I did check in with them as well, and I'd like to share one particular response with you. A young lady named Adela told me that she took my question and approached her friends and classmates with it as well. They reported back that they wanted to celebrate Gresham's growing diversity and establish more amenities like farmer's markets, community centers, cultural festivals, and gardens. Those were all terrific aspirations, and Adela's energy leapt off the page. But I was returned to the brass tacks of reality when I read her closing paragraph. I'll read it for you now. Finally, the most important value in a community is safety. Although many have probably mentioned it, safety is vital if we want our community members to visit the sites, community events, and become more comfortable within our city. One of the first things my friends told me they wanted to see was safer streets and parks. She went on to say, although we are making progress towards decreasing violence, many students and parents are still worried about safety. Well, when I was in Della's age, the thought of feeling unsafe at any time of the day in Gresham would have never crossed my mind. We owe our young people that same level of peace and mind Adela, thank you for your heart, for your city, and for the service on the Youth Advisory Council. Would the members of the Youth Advisory Council please stand and be recognized for your contribution? Thank you. Good work. At the end of the day, I believe we will be judged not on our own personal dynasties in the world, but on what we leave to those who inherit our community. What Gresham will we leave to Adela or the 29,000 other students in Gresham, Barlow, Centennial, and Reynolds school system? That's why we show up to work at this volunteer job, and that's why the members of the council do the same, and why each of you are here tonight on your own time, to pull together, no matter the differences we may have in nuanced perspectives, to make our city the best that it can be. Nearly everything we do is based on trying to improve Gresham's destiny and chart a better future. We'd be hard pressed, however, to identify a more important area in this endeavor than job creation and economic development. It is no secret that we took aggressive action during the recession to, to spark our small business entrepreneurs and to help them set up shop in key areas of our city. Through our garage to storefront program, we were able to help 144 new small businesses open in 225,000 square feet of previously vacant storefront. To give you some idea of this impact, I, I distinctly recall where we were a few years ago when we faced the biggest economic decline of our lifetimes and watched literally before our eyes what it would look like to see business activity as we knew it start to vacate key areas of our city. We decided to essentially put a fee holiday in place forgiving or paying every single city-related fee for small businesses and removing as many barriers to market entry as possible. Our small business entrepreneurs respond, responded and the program was a runaway success. A couple weeks ago, I was invited to give a presentation at the U.S. Conference of Mayors on the success of this program. Now, there are many cities out there who are still suffering from vacancies and blight caused by the recession because they were either unwilling or unable to get government out of the way and let business people do what business people do best. Take risks when others won't and create jobs and vibrancy. Gresham is a national model because we chose to be aggressive when others were fearful. The program has now expired after an initial year and two successful renewals. And while our economy isn't out of the woods yet, downtown is as vibrant as we've seen it in many years. We are now hard at work in planning the next phase of our strategy to encourage vital development and redevelopment. We will not rest on our laurels when it comes to Gresham's citywide vibrancy and our street level economy. While we are moving on from the success of the Garage to Storefront program, we have not lost interest in fostering the best small business climate possible. 
For example, our economic development staff has worked very hard to keep pace with technology, and we have developed a couple pretty cool apps. One focused on helping small business entrepreneurs find a location and get rolling, and one focused on large-scale industrial recruiters. Well, I don't think that a couple smartphone apps are going to be huge game changers. I do think that they help us to continue to keep a competitive edge and foster a friendly environment to investors considering where to locate. The best news, they weren't very expensive, and the functionality is pretty cool. They are free on the App Store, and I encourage you to download them and check them out. In, yep. In addition to the peripheral technological advancements, we've, all, we've also focused on the nuts and bolts old school economic development through con conventional economic development tools. In this past year, we have seen Henningsen Cold Storage leverage a Rockwood New Industries grant to add an additional 70,000 square feet to their operation, a project that was selected as Business Oregon's business development success, success story of the year. Nearby, Teeny Foods is also gearing up for their own expansion bringing jobs and investment to Gresham. And if you've driven through the intersection of Fairview Parkway and Gleason lately, you've probably no doubt seen Microchip's prominent now hiring sign as well. Each year, we work tremendously hard to help cultivate growth in our existing fantastic employers. It may not be as glitzy as chasing the new big fish, and we do our share of that too, but we will never turn our backs on those who have already chosen Gresham and contribute to the backbone of our economy. While there is no doubt that we have a keen eye on small business development and large industrial recruitment, we also pursue economic development goals intended to enhance our day-to-day -day quality of life on the retail level. Now, I'm very excited about the grocery access project on this year's council work plan, which aims to identify and fill any grocery deserts that exist in Gresham. It is never okay for 7-Eleven to be a family's most viable source of sustenance and nutrition. The Grocery Access Project will also take a wide look at where we stand on the natural grocery side of the coin and will aim to provide strategic incentives to recruit national grocery options, which our residents routinely, unbashfully, tell me that they desire. And I hear you, and we are very excited to see natural grocers opening up shop in the former Lazy Boy at 223rd in Burnside. They're slated to pull the, their open sign this uh, next month. Please stop in and give them a big Gresham welcome. Now, I know that uh, there's another natural grocer out there that I know that you want to see. Yeah? Let's just say that they have a... Re <laughs> Doug Walker. Let's just say they have a relationship with a man named Charles Shaw and a frozen food section that would rival the Arctic. I've heard you loud and clear on this one, and we will not stop pursuing Trader Joe's until they come to town. I promise you. Now, without weighing too heavily into the uh, social issues that were involved, I want to tell you a quick story about the Trader Joe's deal that fell apart in Northeast Portland last week. Well, I'm still trying to figure out how improving land values, en enhancing access to healthy food, and creating jobs in a neighborhood somehow makes it worse I didn't want the particular moment in time to pass without pointing out how different their reception would be in Gresham. We've worked hard to court a relationship with Trader Joe's executives over the past several years. So when I heard that the Portland deal was unraveling, I had a gourmet chocolate gift package in the mail immediately for their decision makers. <laughs> complete with a personal note letting Trader Joe's know that Gresham remains open, accepting, and ready for their investment. We're not done with them yet and we will continue to work hard to bring them to town. Now, while we get excited about economic development, high-tech manufacturing, and technological advancements, there are also points in time when we need to pause and consider the natural landscape as well. And to protect the environment, we have been so fortunate to inherit in Gresham. Now, I don't want to dwell on this issue, and I remain hopeful that Mayor Hales and I will be able to work something out. But I don't want the evening to pass without mentioning the controversy we have had with Portland's proposal to put a mega microwave tower on top of Gresham Butte, the natural backdrop to a good portion of this great city. For perspective, unlike, another, unlike a number of other areas in the region, Gresham residents have made the decision time and time again in this city's 109-year history to protect our volcanic buttes and keep them as natural areas and aesthetic jewels. 
Gresham Butte remains the most prominent among them. Now, Portland's BTS bureaucracy would like Gresham Butte's signature feature to be a 140-foot mega tower on the very top, visible from everywhere in this city, with some discrete microwave dishes hanging from it. Now, let me, let me be perfectly clear for a moment. No. The, the answer is no. Too many people have fought too long to protect Gresham Butte for us to sit idly by and let it be marred on our watch. We will engage with every ounce of our power and resources to ensure that we protect it for future de generations. Now, the technocrat proponents of the mega tower will have you believe that public safety dispatch and protecting the natural landscape are mutually exclusive. They are wrong. There are many options to accomplish the same goal, and we will pursue those options vigorously. The public input period on Portland's proposal is open through the 27th at 5 p.m. As an interested party, the city will certainly be submitting its own input, but I hope you too will share your voice. Contact the city's planning department to learn more about how to submit your input. We might be prudently skeptical crowd out here, naturally suspicious of the latest and greatest proposals coming out of the city of Portland, but that doesn't mean that we don't inherently value our parks, vistas, and open spaces. Take Nadaka, for example. A group of citizen volunteers marshaled by our ultra-volunteer, Lee Dayfield, set out a few years ago to create a large urban nature park in the Wilkes East neighborhood of Gresham, just northwest of Rockwood. Now, in the past year, we have helped secure over half a million dollars in state parks grant funding to support the park. They are well on their way to completing a special place in Gresham, and I hope that you will take the time to visit and check them out. It is truly quite remarkable what they've been able to do. This year, we will also mark the completion of work on another major park amenity and start the process of a new one. Through strategic use of federal grant dollars, we were able to fund the creation of a state-of-the-art children's fountain on the Arts Plaza downtown. Now picture any of the recreational fountains across the region that parents haul their kids to during the hot summer months. And now picture not having to make that extra trip, instead being able to visit one right here in our town. Now also picture the economic benefit of keeping those families in Gresham, visiting local merchants here instead of elsewhere. Well, that will be a reality this summer with a planned opening right around the 4th of July, meaning that the fountain should be complete a good month or so before the official Oregon summer starts in August. <laughs> it's, worth a, it's worth a very quick reminder that the funding source for the fountain is a federal community development grant which cannot be used for day-to-day -day services like public safety. In addition to Nadaka and the Children's Fountain, we have our eyes on perhaps Gresham's most prominent future park, a beautiful natural viewpoint atop Hogan Butte. Now we have owned this property for a future park for some time now, but we have struggled to put together the resources to create it. This year we will be pursuing a state parks grant to, to begin putting in place improved amenities. If you haven't been up here yet, you are in for a real treat. Clear views of Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams, the Columbia River Gorge, and Mount Hood abound and it will truly be a legacy addition to our parks portfolio for future generations. Now there are a number of these opportunities on the horizon. Last year during this speech I announced a plan to engage the community in a very broad conversation focused on identifying anything and everything that could enhance our quality of life in Gresham. We intended for the Rise Advance Dream initiative to be the broadest engagement process Gresham has seen to date and it will employ some fun technological tools along the way. We've assembled a citizen steering committee and started getting some ideas on the table. The volunteers are just getting up and running and they will also be reaching out and broadening the discussion citywide to get input from all across Gresham. You're going to be hearing a lot more about RAD in the coming months and I'm very excited to see this community dr driven process uh, guide our strategic future. Now, we are certainly not awash in cash, but if we let that be an excuse for inaction and a failure to plan for the future, we will get left behind. That said, while we work to maintain continued progress, we also can't lose sight of maintaining order in our existing assets and our shared spaces. Perhaps like never before, I was troubled last summer to see vagrancy and incivility in our city parks be it the so-called young toughs loitering in the coho shelter at Main City Park, 
or the gang-related homicide we had at Red Sunset Park. We've got some work cut out for us in holding the line on public safety in our park system. It's worth noting that we put in place the necessary ordinance to hold those who violate park rules accountable and actually exclude them if they prove to be chronic problems. Parks should be available for everybody's responsible use. On the issue of chronic residents in our shared space as a main city park, I will also continue to nudge gently or otherwise our partners at the county to ensure East County's appropriate share of mental health, housing, and vocational resources are available to help address the issues we are experiencing. As Portland gentrifies and pushes those issues our direction, the county absolutely must be nimble in reacting to them and adjusting <laughs> and the resources need to adjust accordingly. One thing is for sure, there is nothing compassionate about letting people live their lives in camping trails or parks or back alleys. This state's broken approach to the homeless and substance abuse and mental health is neither effective nor compassionate. Thank you. At the same time, we are not naive to the changing landscape of the suburban need. And I know that the city too will need to evaluate new ways to address these urban issues. Which brings me to Red Sunset Park. Raise your hand if you know the story of how Red Sunset Park was added to Gresham's portfolio of iconic public spaces. Anyone? Yeah? Good. There's a few folks that were around for that. For context, the Fanning family donated funds for that park to the city in the 1980s. And it was created with all of the landscape design bells and whistles available at the time, including its namesake, the Red Sunset Maple Tree, which was developed right here in the Gresham area by J. Frank Schmidt Nursery. Nearly immediately, it became one of Gresham's flagship parks, a sign to the region that we take pride in our community and we invest in our amenities. Now fast forward to today when just last summer we had an actual gang-related homicide on the basketball court in that park. Now, I'm not new to the area and I know that we certainly have had our struggles with gangs, but that incident was a stark reminder that gang activity can threaten our quality of life and our ability to feel safe anywhere in this city. Now, no matter how you look at it, we have had a movement of big city urban crime issues creeping our direction for a long time. And the days when we could sit back and hope that we could just remain our own little pioneer oasis have long since left us. Like it or not, we are a big city now, complete with all of the issues and all of the opportunities that that distinction presents. Now, it pains me to point to money as one of the solutions to these issues. But if we continue to believe that we can skate by with the cheapest local government of any decent sized city in Oregon, we will continue to be the landing pad for a bunch of issues we are simply not equipped to address. The last time Gresham voters approved revenue on a ballot for city operations was in 1993. That was over 20 years ago. In the years since Gresham voters have approved city revenue, Hillsboro, Beaverton, Tigard, Tualatin, Sherwood, Wilsonville, Canby, Lake Oswego, West Lynn, Oregon City, Gladstone, Portland, Happy Valley, Estacada, Troutdale, and even Damascus have all had voter approved funding measures. Now Gresham stands nearly alone. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you should be approving every arts tax or every library district that you see on the ballot. But I will say that if we don't take a step back and give public safety a long, hard look and ultimately a few dollars, we're not going to have a community left to enjoy. Now, I could stand behind this podium all day long and tell you my feeling about the importance of choosing a better path forward in our community. There's no question that we're passionate about it. But I suspect that there is no more powerful conveyor of this message than hearing from each other and from those who have had stakes in Gresham for many, many years. We put together a short video and, uh, to collect some of their sentiments. Please turn your direction to the video. My name is Carol Nielsen Hood. I have lived in Gresham for over 40 years, so I'm considered a longtime uh, citizen of Gresham. In the last couple of years, I've needed the fire department at my house several times. 
And I've got to tell you, they were there immediately. They were most courteous and did what they needed to do and directed us which direction we needed to go. And I have so appreciated it because there would be nobody else that I could call that could respond that quickly to my needs. Police and fire, uh, park services are extremely important. Um, without a strong uh, first responder infrastructure in the city, the city, it can't, it won't succeed. Um, and that fall, the parks fall in line with that as well. Uh, without places for people to go and unwind after working all day long on the weekends with their families and friends, without that, um, I think the city will also hurt from that. So um, strong police, fire, parks department is, is very important for the growth and, and future of the city, of any city, but especially Gresham. <laughs> I was born and raised in Gresham, went to Gresham High School, graduated in 98. Uh, my parents graduated from Gresham High School. My grandparents graduated from Gresham High School. Um, we've been here our whole lives and we don't see any change to that anytime soon. My name is Mark Eisenzimmer. I've lived in this community for 56 years and I'm not a big tax guy, but I do know that we need to fund police and fire first. Our top priority has to be public safety. Hi, I'm Betty Chisholm and I was born here in Gresham, so I'm very proud of my city. And even though we're the fourth largest city in the state, it's still a very local community. I am really for this levy because even though I have an alarm system, when I push that button, I want the cops here now, or I want the fire department here now. We just need them here. One of the, the key components of any community is the perception that people outside the community have of that community. Perception is reality, whether it's based in reality or not, the perception is critical. And to start with that perception, you need to have a good solid foundation, and that foundation is public safety. It's police and fire protection, that's where it all starts. Do I want to move my business there? Do I want to raise my kids there? Do I want to buy a house there? Uh, this is all part of that process. Oh, well, there were no gangs in those days, no, nothing like that. Things today are more complicated than they were then. I think it's really important that Gresham keep up with uh, some of the other, out, other outlying communities. Uh, if we don't fund our schools, if we don't take care of public safety, our police and fire, we lose to these other communities. And it's really important that uh, for us to be able to attract business and to attract new families to our community that we keep up. Every community has their good days and bad days. Um, my hope would be that support for the levy could possibly bring more good days to the city of Gresham. Some good folks there. Did you know that uh, Dick Dowsett's grandfather opened up the first drugstore in Gresham in 1902, a few, a few years before we even incorporated as a city? Marty Stone's dad gave me my first job at Gordon Stone's department store in downtown Gresham. Carol Nielsen Hood is the reason I got involved in city government to begin with after meeting her at the Gresham Area Chamber of Commerce. So now you know who to, who to all blame. <laughs> the Eisenzimmers have been involved in Gresham for decades. And Randy Lauer, man, I just wish I could jump on a box like that guy can. <laughs> and Betty Chisholm, who I suspect many of you probably know and who would have loved to have been here tonight for this speech. Actually, I'm totally kidding with you. Despite my invitation, Betty's at the Elks Club right now playing bingo. <laughs> and she's probably having way more fun than you all are. But Gresham uh, could use a thousand more Betty Chisholms. We'll certainly take the one that we've got. So these folks are part of that collective backbone that constitutes our community, as are each and every one of you in this room tonight. When I, when I stop to think about the state of our city, and when, candidly, I get a little bit worried about the magnitude of the challenges we face, I remember that you, the people of Gresham, are the best asset any city could ever have when it comes to staring down any challenge. Do we have what we need right now to confront and defeat the public safety and livability challenges we face in the coming years? No. No, we don't. But do we have the human infrastructure, the passionate core, the vested, the involved, the engaged citizenry to put those tools in place? For the first time in the past couple decades, I honestly believe that we do. This message doesn't require the hard sell. Those of you that are here this evening fully know Gresham. 
we have great schools with good graduation rates, and we remain poised to seize the day on economic development and jobs on the near horizon. Gresham has been around for 109 years, and I have every confidence that we'll be around for 109 more. The question isn't whether or not Gresham is a stable, terrific community. It is. The question is, what aspirations do we have for Gresham, and what quality of life do we want to enjoy? Those are the areas in which I believe we have tremendous opportunity for growth. For a moment, forget for a moment that I'm standing up here as the mayor. As a father, and as a husband, and a small business owner, and a volunteer in this community, I have all of the hope in the world for my hometown. And I know that you do too. There are two possible trajectories for Gresham. One of them starts to look like an area we would not want to raise our families or live out our golden years. The other looks like the Gresham we love, making investments, beaming with pride, enjoying the teddy bear parade and the arts festivals that have come to define our community fabric and spirit. Talk to any good business owner, large or small, and they'll tell you that from time to time it is necessary to make investments in order to remain relevant and competitive. That's not a Republican thing or a Democratic thing. That is a market force reality. We will have a police, fire, and parks levy on the ballot this coming May. In classic Gresham style, 95% of the revenue will be set aside for public safety and 5% will support our park system. This revenue will replace the expiring police, fire, and parks fee and will fund the services that it helped support as we prevented immediate layoffs last year. For perspective, that means the equivalent of around 20 police positions, two, two fire stations, and a third of our park's maintenance operation, not to mention the, the importance of protecting our livability and home values. When I think about what that city would look like without those services, I have a hard time even imagining it. Put simply, it isn't Gresham. At least it's not the Gresham that I came to when I enrolled for school in this building and started putting down roots of my own. It certainly wouldn't be a Gresham where we could be proud of what we're leaving for our children. But I don't want to dwell on that too much. If the people who settled in this area were willing to face the perils of the Oregon Trail for their families, we are capable of making our own sacrifices and investments today. Despite the threats and challenges we face, the state of our city is strong because the people you saw on the video and the people in this room all want Gresham to be great. Gresham is strong because though we may disagree with each other from time to time, we still remember that we are neighbors and that we have a solemn duty to be there for each other and for our kids and for those who will inherit the product of our labor. Yes, we are at a crossroads. We're at a defining moment. The actions that we take right now in the coming months will dictate who we are and what we stand for. That is not inconsequential or unsubstantial. This community has been absolutely terrific to me from the moment I arrived at the front door of this school to the present day nurturing my young family. We have built something special here. And that's not common, folks. Communities across the country would kill for that foundation. Thank you for the incredible privilege of serving as your mayor. I appreciate your confidence and your support. And my pledge to you is that I will stop at nothing to protect Gresham's legacy, our core services, and our unparalleled pride. You all are terrific people, and it is truly an honor to call you my neighbors. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Thank you.